Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Never ever has there been a mighty work of God apart from prayer. It's not that prayer ties God up and makes him do what we want like some kind of puppet, but rather righteous prayer, the kind of prayer that begs, that pleads, that recognizes our inability, our weakness, our dependency, and his super ability to do anything. This kind of I need you desperately prayer does much. So for God to stir in my life, for God to break sin's strongholds, for God to change my heart, for God to burn a fire for his holiness before my eyes, I must pray. The new normal means a life of unceasing prayer. Well, good morning. Good day. You're here. I'm glad you're with us. Also online, thank you for joining us. I know we have... Uh, hundreds and hundreds of people that dial in, and we're glad that you're part of it. Uh, we are in a series, The New Normal, talking about prayer, how prayer is part of our life. We've actually been in a month long, 21 days of prayer and fasting. Today is day 21, so it ends at the end of today. And so uh, we do that because we want to see God. We, wanna, we want God's intervention. We want to connect with him in a powerful way. So we've been doing that. We've been doing Saturday, all church prayer. We've been doing weekend services, study. We're just, we're really pressing in saying, God, we need to hear from you. And we want to, uh, we, we want to uh, make some spiritual breakthroughs. And so today we're going to be talking, closing out this series and this, this season of really seeking God in prayer with how to hear God. Now, this is so important because that is, that is what makes uh, pr your prayer life come alive in a whole new way. I mean, you may have been brought up thinking and been told that prayer is just you kind of just tossing these prayers out into the, you know, out into the atmosphere. You know, you just throw them out there and maybe he hears them, maybe he doesn't, you know, who knows? And, that, and there's nothing, obviously that's part of it. We do talk, we have a role, but God also wants to communicate to us. And if your prayer life only consists of you doing Hail Marys and you're just throwing these prayers out and you never actually hear from God, that's, that's a problem. Th that, that means you're, you're, for, you're not going to be that excited about prayer. Prayer will be static. It'll be stale. It won't be what it's meant to be. God wants to speak to you. He has things he has to say. He wants to say to you. Any good relationship is more than just one person talking all the time. And that's true with our relationship with God. God has something he wants to communicate to you. And so that's so important. We need to be open to that, right? We'd, if you would, turn, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. That's the passage we're looking at today. You go, hey, I didn't bring my Bible. Well, you, you probably have a smartphone, right? Download a Bible app. Uh, there's a lot of good ones, and just open it up to uh, Luke chapter 8, because that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at a story that Jesus tells in order to help us to better hear God's voice. So, because God wants to speak to us, and we've got to be open to that. And, uh, and, and some people say, you know, I just don't, you know, I don't, I don't hear God speak. Well, there's things we can do to be able to better hear God's voice. We, we, there's things we can do to kind of tune into Him. You know, like if you still listen to the radio in your car, you know, you got to dial it in. It's not like he's not, it's not like the airwaves aren't there. They're there. We're just not dialed in. And God wants to speak to you, but we got to dial into him. Now, Jesus says in that passage, he says, he who has ears, let him hear. He's not talking about the little piece of cartilage and skin on the side of your head. He's talking about your spiritual ears. He's talking about there's things you can do so that you can hear and you can dial into what God has to say. And he, wants, and, and he wants to speak to you. Now, Jesus tells a story in this passage about uh, a farmer. He says this farmer goes out and he puts seed down on four different types of soil. 
Now, fortunately, uh, we're told what, those, wh what this story means because the disciples go up afterwards after he tells the story. They go, Jesus, what exactly were you, what did all that mean? And he explains it. He goes, hey, there's four different types of soils for di four different types of people. And, 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 th and those four soils represent how we hear God, how God interacts with us. So you could almost like say, well, you know, you know, am I soil number one, soil number two? You know, that person's soil number one, that person's soil, and that's true. But also within our own ebb and flow of living, there's sometimes moments where I, I'm more interested in hearing what God has to say than others. And so sometimes I am kind of in my own, uh, in my own season of life, I'm, I'm more like soil number one or soil number two. And, and so God is, he, Jesus tells the story because God wants to speak to us. He says, these are things you can do to hear God better. We can actually, we play a role in this. So let's look at this real briefly on how to hear God's voice. Number one, okay, in order to hear God speak to you, you've got to cultivate an open mind. In other words, you have to have uh, that desire. You've got to want to hear God. Some people, they don't, they don't want to hear God. They, they're really just not interested. They don't believe God speaks. I mean, they're just, they've kind of shut that all down. They have a closed mind. They're not interested, and they don't think God's going to speak to them, and then they're not disappointed because, you know, he, does, he never speaks to me. You know, he's, and, and let me just say as a side note, sometimes people, they read the, the Old Testament, and they see the way God speaks verbatim and long passages to the prophets, and they think, oh, well, I don't hear God like that. But listen, when we look in the New Testament, God often speaks in, 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 in a different way, really. We hear God more, but often in a, what, you know, uh, like impressions, maybe in, in our own voice, in our own mind, we'll hear it, but we can delineate that. God speaks through other people. God speaks through circumstances. God impresses us through his own word and kind of lists those, uh, like brings them alive and ignite something inside our heart, burns in our hearts, the, Bi the Bible says. So th those are the kinds of things, but, it's, but it can happen all day long. All day long, we're kind of getting, uh, you know, this, this sense of hearing God's voice. So it's, it's very natural. It won't sound like a, maybe an audible voice like from heaven, you know, like James Earl Jones, you know, speaking. You know, it's, it, it'll sound probably more like your own voice. That's why we call it naturally supernatural. It's very natural. But it's, but it's supernatural. God's at work. So here's what Jesus says in this story. He says, while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, Jesus told this parable. Now watch. He says, a farmer went out to sow his seed and he was scattering the seed. Some fell along the path that was trampled on and the birds of the air ate it up. And then drop down to verse 12. He tells what that meant when he's talking to the disciples. He says, those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. So this, this it's an agricultural environment here. This farmer's going out. He's broadcasting seed out so that it would take root. But on the path that he's walking on, it's hardened. And this is often people that would cut through people's yards, cut through people's farms. And after a while, they would just like, there would be a path that would form, right? They would, and after enough people trampled on it, it'd become hard. And so when he's putting seed down on that particular uh, area, there's, it's too hard. And so no seed can go in, and so it doesn't grow. I have that problem in my own house. Uh, I have, uh, uh, we don't have a lot of parking, and we do, a f over the years, we've just done a lot, of, uh, a lot of meetings, a lot of people at our house, and there's no really street parking, and so people have to park, like, in our parking lot, which is not very big, so we just told people over the years, hey, you can just park on our grass, and after a while, there wasn't grass anymore. It was just, like, dirt, so we called some professionals and said, hey, we want grass here. He goes, hey, listen, you got a problem. You're letting people park on your grass, and that's why it's dirt now, because he, ca he calls it compactation. In other words, it's so compacted, nothing can grow. I said, well, can't you aerate it? He goes, yeah, it's the same problem's going to happen. you got to stop people from, from driving on your, on your grass. And so I, I thought, well, you know what? No, it's too important to me. Well, I, I love having people over. We do a lot. We're doing stuff for God. So, you know, th I guess this is just going to be dirt. So we don't have any grass in, in, in a part where it's kind of like a little parking lot now. It's just dirt. And nothing can grow there because 
it's, it's been, uh, well, I wouldn't say trampled on. I love having you guys over, you know, but, but uh, you know, it's just so many people have parked on it. And it's gotten so hard. This is what happens when, when it gets trampled on, when it gets walked on. And Jesus says, this is our condition of some of our heart. Our hearts get trampled on. They get hardened. They get jaded. And then the seed, God's word, can't penetrate. It can't get in and there's no growth. He goes, that's, that's a big problem. That's a big problem. Why would our hearts, you know, get trampled on? Well, why would we close down and say, you know, I'm not interested in what God has to say? Well, there, there's different reasons. Let me give you three. Three reasons. One is because of fear. We've been hurt before, and we don't want to get hurt again. If you've been hurt, if you've been devastated, if you've been betrayed, if you've been hurt really bad, you know, the, the, you know that's horrible. That's so, that's so gut-wrenching. You think, I never want to be hurt like that again. If you're normal, you think that, right? You, you feel that? You don't want that? Who wants that? But what happens is when we start making those declarations, we start building walls. We start hardening our heart. We say, nobody is ever going to hurt me again. And sometimes it's, that, that applies to God. Maybe we're disappointed with God. God's not going to, we just build walls. That's a hardening. That's a problem. People hurt people all the time. You know, that's probably one of the biggest reasons people don't go to church. I've talked to a number of people who say, you know, I don't go to church. Why? Because so-and-so, you know, they called themselves a Christian. They're a hypocrite. They hurt me. If somebody's going to act like that, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to church. That's, they're all filled with, you know, with people that just, that hurt me is what they're saying. And, and let me just say this. Never, ever let a person or an event keep you from having a relationship with God no matter what they've done, because then they really hurt you twice, right? They've hurt you, and now you're not even, now you've kind of distanced yourself from God. So don't let that happen, but people do it all the time, because they get hurt, and they just say, it's, it's fear is really what it is. Then there's pride. Pride would keep us from God, closing our minds off, hardening ourselves up. Pride, just, you know, hey, I'm going to just do it on my own. I don't need any help. Things are going fine. I'll make it work. But pride really is, really just, a way of protecting our insecurities. The truth is, things are everybody has things that aren't working out for them. Everybody has weaknesses, and we don't want to own up to those. And so instead of just owning up to those, we just, pride just lets, gets in the way and say, oh, we're fine. We don't, I don't need help. You know, so fear, pride. Another one is just bitterness. You know, life is hard. We do have horrible things happen and difficult, and we can, we can just close ourselves off and just say, it's too hard, it's too painful. And bitterness, we just kind of become in this cocoon. All those things would cause us to have a hard heart. Notice he says, the hard pathway where some of the seed fell, there in Mark 4, 15, represents the hard hearts of those who hear God's message. Satan comes at once to try to make them forget it. So that's, that's what Satan's trying to do. He wants to make you, he wants to keep you from God. So he's, Satan's involved in this, using those hardships in the world to keep you from God. So Jesus tells the story. He says, don't be like that. You know, you get a hard heart, you know, and, and, uh, and then the seed doesn't get in. Then the birds come and they eat it. And he says, then you're barren. You're, you don't have any fruit. And so Jesus is saying, the hard heart, that's for the birds, <laughs> Right? You don't want to do that. He says, therefore, I get rid of all moral filth, James says, and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word, notice this, planted in you, which can save you. He says, let your defenses down. Let God's word get planted in you. Watch what happens. So we need to cultivate, if we're going to hear God's voice, we've got to cultivate that part of us. Then we've got to allocate time to listen. In other words, you, you have to be quiet and take time to hear God. Sometimes we're just too busy, right? We have a preoccupied mind. Maybe not a closed mind, but a preoccupied mind. We've got so much going on, we don't have time to really hear from God. Here Jesus goes on. He says, other seed fell on shallow soil with rock beneath. Circle that word shallow. It's a key word there. Shallow soil. This seed began to grow, but soon withered and died for lack of moisture. Jesus explains this in verse 13. He says, those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy, when they hear it, but they have no root. 
They have no root. Circle that. No root. They believe for a while, but the time of testing comes and they fall away. And so this, the rocky soil, this is really not just like soil with rocks, but it's, it's, it's a rock layer below a thin layer of topsoil. And this is common, in especially arid cultures. I, came, I was raised in Tucson, Arizona. We had that there where you had this thin layer. I, would, it was cert, I don't think it was topsoil. It was like dirt, you know, thin layer of dirt, maybe a half an inch. And then below that was like concrete. It was dirt, but it was mixed in with, with limestone. And over the years, it had just gotten, it was like, it was like concrete. So nothing could get below there. And so when I, when we would try to, you know, when I was asked or told as a kid to uh, dig a hole for like a tree or something, I mean, I had to get out there with a pickaxe. I'm out there for hours trying to get through this stupid concrete. I mean, it's tough. It's not like here. I mean, I still don't like digging holes, but I can do it, and, you know, a fraction of the time than when I was a, a kid because it just, it doesn't go through. And this is what he's describing. He's saying that, that there's another kind of soil that looks okay if you just look at it, but really it's, it's very thin. No root can go in. And he says they receive it with joy. They get all excited. And I've seen that so many times here. P- people, they get all excited. They, they come to church. They, they hear the message. They come, they come up and they'll say, hey, Pastor Andy, my goodness, that is so cool. What a great service. Uh, it was, oh, my goodness, it was amazing. I was, I, I, you made me cry. And, and then they never come back. I never see them again, you know. How does that happen? How does it that somebody gets all emotional, all excited, but there's no transformation? Nothing's really changing in their life. That's because they have no root, right? They receive it with joy. They sprout up real quick. Hey, but the minute what happens is when the sun comes up, right? Jesus says when, they, when, when the persecution comes, when it gets difficult, boom, they blow away. They don't, they don't have anything to anchor them in. Luke 8, 13 in the Living Bible says this, the stony ground represents those who enjoy listening to sermons, but somehow the message never really gets through to them. Is that you? Is that, do you listen to sermons and it's not really changing you? But somehow the, the, the message never really gets through to them and doesn't take root and grow. They know the message is true and sort of believe it for a while, but then when the hot winds of persecution blow, they lose interest. They lose interest. This is a problem. And so all of us tend to forget anyways. You know, within 72 hours, you, you forget 95% of what you hear. That means by Wednesday, you'll have forgotten 95% of what, what I just said. And that makes me sad. <laughs> you might be thinking, I'm only keeping the 5% worth of remembering, Andy, but I don't know. All I'm saying is that it, it, we forget stuff. And if we don't do, that's part of the reason I put in an outline, so you can review it. One of the best things you can do is, is pull it out at lunch. Some, just make that part of your pattern. Once every week, you just pull it out, you, you, uh, you go through. You know, we have a small group, and their small group, their curriculum is studying outline. They look it over. I think I have a picture. Do I have a picture? There they are. See, sermon outline. This is, so they, they go through that. And so that's, you bring your outline with you. And, you, and we, they just kind of go through it, but go through it deeper. And then they start talking about how is it changing my life. They want roots. You want roots, you got, you've got to do something intentional about it. You've got to make sure, hey, I don't want a superficial mind. It says they believe for a while. But when the pressure's on, that's what determines whether you have roots or not. See, and that's not the time to, to get roots. You know, wow, things are really bad. I just, all these, hor- you know, everything's coming against me right now. This is the time to get roots. No. Roots are something you develop before the pressure's on, before all of that stuff comes against you. Now notice he says, uh, he says, happy is the person. Where do we get roots? We don't get it from just coming to church. We get it from spending time with God in his word, listening to God, praying to God. He says, happy is the person who loves the Lord's teaching. He thinks about those teachings day and night. Day and night, you're kind of, God, what are you saying? He is strong like a tree planted by a river. It produces fruit in season. Its leaves don't die. Everything he does will succeed. He says, when you're staying in God's word, even when you're in a harsh environment, an arid climate, you'll still produce fruit because you're connected in with God. You'll still prosper. So number three, 
you eliminate the distraction. So you com c cultivate your mind. You allocate time to listen. You eliminate distractions. In other words, you've got to get time, quiet time with God. There's, instead of so much stuff going on. You know, worries, career bills. Here's what Jesus says. Other seed fell among the thorns. Now he's talking about weeds here. That's what thorns is weeds, which grew up and which grew up with it and choked the plants. Now here's Jesus' explanation. He says, The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. And so here you have this, this, the, these, the third soil he talks about. The first one was the hard ground, right? It's trampled on by people. That's how it gets hard. You go, well, I don't want my heart trampled on. I don't want my mind trampled on. Well, you got to be careful because there's a lot of people that have no problem trampling all over your mind. You know, when you're watching Netflix, there's philosophies behind all of those movies, those sitcoms, those reality TV shows. There's a, there's a counter philosophy often than what God says in his word. Same thing with, with, with YouTube. You watch, you know, all those shows and, and uh, there, there's just all of that stuff. There's counter philosophy. Not, I'm not saying it all is. But there's plenty of it that is. And if you just sit there hour after hour, you, they trample over your mind. After a while, it gets hard. You're not even aware of it. Just so many people just trampled across your mind. So you've got to be careful about that. Philosophies are you, are th that will make you where you're not open to God and what he has to say, his word. Secondly, he talks about having a mind that is, that is, uh, that is receptive to God. And it, there's something that's joyful about it, but there's no roots. There's no roots because you're not spending time with God. So he says, be careful of that. Third, he's talking about now, we're just too busy. We've got so much going on, we don't really take time uh, to, to uh, connect in with God. And therefore, it chokes out the fruit. It, 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 it grows up. He says it grows up with it, but then it chokes it out. It chokes it out. Notice he says here, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are good fruit. These are things that we want, right? I'd like more joy, more patience, more self-control. Where do I get those things? It's fruitfulness that comes from spending time with God. When I ignore that, when I don't, when I, when I let the other, the weeds crowd that out, I'm not fruitful. It looks like it's working out because it's growing up, but it's, it's got all these, these, these weeds. And I've got to be careful. You know, I have weeds in my yard. Not, not the word the dirt, as I already told you about that. You can tell my yard doesn't look very nice. So I got dirt and I got weeds. <laughs> but what's interesting is I never had to go out and plant the weeds. I, Sharon and I never had like, a, you know, well, let's have weeds. We want different varieties. No, I mean, <laughs> the weeds just grow. It's the grass that I want to grow that I can't grow. The weeds choke out the grass. What I want isn't there because I have so many weeds. And I could take care of the weeds, but I have to go, if they're in the garden, I have to pull them out. If they're mixed in with the grass, I have to somehow, you know, treat that. See, weeds are a sign of neglect. When I neglect it, the weeds come. I don't have to plant those. I don't have to go out of my way to get weeds. And that's what happens in our own life. When we, when we neglect time with God, when we allow other things to choke it off, what are those other things? Well, they're not all bad. It can be just lots of activity. We're just so busy. With activities, we're driving kids around, and we're, uh, we're working on our career, we're working on school, we've got bills, we've got payments, we've got all these things we're, we're, we're doing, we're picking up extra work, and, and what, what, here's the thing, Any, what, is, what is a weed? Anything that's keeping you from God. Anything that is keeping you from God. This, by the way, is why we do this 21 days of prayer and fasting. You go, well, what's up with fasting? I like to eat. Why, why are you doing this? It's a, you're harassing me. I don't like that. No, that's not what it's about. Fasting is particularly important. Certainly, they've, it's, it's, a law, it's been around for thousands of years. Jesus fasted. Every, you know, it's, a, it's a spiritual a practice. But fasting probably is more important today than ever before because we're so busy. We have so much going on. God gets leftovers, if anything. And so what fasting is, is we say, I'm going to take a piece of something that's probably not critical, I could go without, 
and I'm going to not do that for a, few, for a few weeks, you know, for 21 days. And in its place, I'm going to insert God because God's gotten the leftovers. See, God hasn't gotten first place in my life. That's the whole principle of it. Not some kind of legalistic thing to harass you and make you feel uncomfortable. No, it's because we are just too busy and we end up having a preoccupied mind where we're just, there's no place for God in it. We're just, you know, we're, we're, the weeds are choking out the fruitfulness. And so he says there's life's worries that are weeds, just all the worries of life. He talks about riches that we're so interested and consumed with making a, a, a living. We don't make a life. We miss the important things. Then he talks about life's pleasure. You say pleasures can get in the way? Certainly. You know, when your recreation becomes more important than, your, than, than worship, than spending time with God, and it's all about your next vacation, and it's all about your hobby and going shopping or golfing, and every, you're, you're, you're fitting those things in, but then that becomes a weed. And he says, be careful of those three things. Notice he says there, Mark 4, 18 and 19 in the Living Bible, the thorny ground represents the hearts of people who listen to the good news and receive it. But all too quickly, the attractions of this world, the delights of wealth, and the search for success, and the lure of nice things come in and crowd out God's message from their hearts so that no crop is produced. And that's sad because it, th this certainly is better than the hard soil. It's even better than the shallow soil, but it still is unproductive. In the day, when the day's done, it's just as productive as the other two. So then he talks about this last one. He, says, he talks about this, the good soil, which is cooperating with what God says to you. In other words, right up from the beginning, you say, God, I'm going to do whatever you say. I'm, I'm going to trust you. I believe that you've got my best interest in mind, and I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. Luke 8, verse 8, he says, Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And then verse 15 says, And the seed on good soil stands for those with noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and persevering, and, and persevering produce a crop. This is a willing mind. Somebody says, I am willing to do it. I love this verse here in James. He says, Do not merely listen to the word. And so what happens? If we're just listening and nothing really happens, we go, Hey, that's a cool sermon. Hey, that's a cool Bible teaching. What's happening? He says, We're deceiving ourselves. He says, don't do that. He says, do what it says. And so the result of productivity, the this result of this, of, this, of this good soil, of being open to God, is we're increased productivity. So you're saying, Andy, that if I spend time with God, I open up his word and I spend some time praying and reading his word and interacting with God, that I will be more productive? Well, I'm not saying that. Well, that's what Jesus said increase productivity. So that means that on your busiest days, the days where you think, oh, I'm so busy, I don't have any time to spend time with God. Jesus said, no, you've got it all wrong. See, God is able to bless the other time. Somehow in God's economy, when we put him first, when we put God first, he actually blesses the other time, the, all the other stuff we're trying to do, and we become more productive. We become more, it's, it's, it's certainly there's a supernatural element to it. But God says that's where he interacts with us. That's what he does. It's kind of like tithing in a way. We give 10% to God and he says, then he blesses the other 90%. You say, no, I have less money now. Well, not according to God's economy. He says that he blesses the other 90% and it makes it worth more, it produces more for you than it would if you hadn't done it. It's just the way God does things. So if you, I think God puts that in a promise for us when we think, oh, I don't know if I should be giving. I don't know if I should spend time with God in prayer because I'm so busy. I have so many things. To do. Jesus says, you want to be productive? You really want to be productive? Put God first in those areas. Put God first in them. Now, let me ask you, if you were to, if, if there was like a brain scan, some kind of God scan that he could scan your brain, and, and what kind of mind would you have? Would you have a heart? Would you have a closed mind? hardened heart just you're really not open to it you know you just kind of cross your arms prove it you know as, as though we have the right to even do that with God 
Do you have a clo- is it because maybe though the fear you're thinking God will make you fanatic, make you take away your fun? All, there's a lot of things to be afraid of that causes us to be closed down. Could be fear, could be pride, insecurity. Could just be that we're so hurt and so bitter, so wounded. Or maybe if there was a brain scan, maybe it would be more of a shallow mind where you get excited, you're emotional, but really there's not a lot of life change happening. And you know it, you know it. I mean, if you do anything long enough, you learn the little cliches and the things that you can say to kind of, you know, hide really what's going on. But you know when you're alone, you know if you're really changing. You know if God's at work in your life. And he says that the shallow mind doesn't allow roots to go down. That comes from, there's no other way. It's not about going to church. I'm glad you're here, but it's about spending time with God and his word. That's where the roots are developed. So, or would it be a preoccupied mind if that brain scan, you know, just I've got so much going on. I'm juggling all these things. I hope God understands. I'm just skimming through life. And he's part of that. This, that's maybe the problem. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Maybe that is the problem. You know, you can be so caught up with activity. Activity and productivity are not the same thing. You can be like a rat on a wheel. You're going nowhere fast. You're juggling all kinds of things and you're in a hurry for no reason. And it's hard to settle down. It's hard to quiet ourselves down. Some of us, that's, we're uncomfortable with that. When we're, when we're in a quiet room, we've got a music on, we've got to have something going on. But God wants to speak to us, sometimes in those quiet places. And that's where we develop the good soil. The good soil. You see, God, the seed is the same. He scatters the seed. It's the soil that determines whether we're productive. The, the, the soil determines our spiritual harvest that we get. And we get to choose that. It's not predetermined. Those soils, you can choose, hey, you know what? Today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to change things up. You know how God changes a hard heart? He brings rain. Hard ground is softened with storms. Maybe some of you are in a storm. You're in a difficult place. And you're thinking, I don't want this. But you know, and I'm not, if you're in a storm, I'm sorry for you. I'm not wishing that on you. But I can tell you that through storms, God can use that to soften us, to do something that he couldn't do any other way. And so maybe God's speaking to you through that. Maybe he wants to soften your heart so he can talk to you and speak to you. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I pray for everybody here. Everybody here is in one of those places that Jesus described. I pray for those who are, for those who are just there. You know who you are. Your heart is hard. You're not even proud of it, maybe. If you're going, I don't even know how I got to this place. But the truth is, I'm closed down. I pray, let me pray for you. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name that you bring whatever's caused these hearts to get hard, that you bring the rain, you bring softening, or that you break through. It does take apart from you, though. You have to be willing to say, God, soften my heart. You might be in a place where you're saying, I don't even know where to begin. I don't know how to do that. Well, start, it starts there, my friend. It starts with you saying, God, give me the desire to have an open mind, a softened heart. And when you do that, God meets you more than halfway. He comes into your zone, into your area. He'll start, he, he loves you so much. He, has, he wants to communicate and talk to you and direct you and love on you and encourage you. You say, God, help me to have that desire to have an open heart, a soft heart. Maybe you have a shallow or superficial mind. You're kind of skimming through, but there's no roots happening. You're not doing anything intentionally to develop roots. 
And this will be such a sad day when, this, when the heat of persecution, when the, when the difficulties of life come your way, when you'll wish you had had a root. Why not today just say, God, I'm going to start developing roots. If that means I'm going to start go, going into a small group to help me. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what it takes. I'm going to start carving out a little bit of time. You know, if you do nothing with God at all, it begins with one minute. You say, every day, one minute, I'm going to open up and at least read one verse and say one prayer. Maybe that's your starting point. You say, God, I, I'm going to do that. I can do a minute. And then watch it grow. Watch God bless that. Some of you might be in a preoccupied mind. You have so much going on. You've got the worries of life. You've got all of this activity swirling around you. And it's choking out your spiritual relationship with God. You say, God, I'm, maybe I need to fast a little longer. Maybe I'd skip fasting. I need to, I need to fast from something. Maybe Netflix or YouTube or, or gaming or maybe, a piece, maybe food. I don't know. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put something aside so I can carve out a little room for you. If you've never put Jesus into your life, asked him into your life, this is the starting place where you just say, and just pray with me if, if you would, just say, Jesus, come into my life. Renew my heart. I want to hear your voice to experience salvation not just in the future, but today. Would you say, God, free me? In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.